Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Yes, We're Here. Uh, it's the Michael K. and I and Eagle Show. We're excited as we move forward to continue to talk to each other more than we have in our entire lives. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I, I want to I be honest right out of the gate here. I'm wearing cologne for some reason. It was as if I was getting ready for a date. I have no idea why I put on cologne, but I wanted to smell my best for you. The beautiful thing is that with the, the genius of Zoom, I can actually smell you. <laughs> I know. The, the second part is I wasn't sure we were going to get past the pilot stage. <laughs> we did our first episode. You don't know how people are, are going to react to it. So the question of episode two was very much a factor, and somehow we've graduated to the second episode. My dad was a comedic actor, stand-up comedian, musician, and he actually did pilot season in LA when I was a young kid. I was eight or nine years old. And he appeared in two pilots that aired on network television. Neither got picked up, but I think to myself, my life would have changed dramatically if either the Lorenzo Music Show, who was Carlton the Doorman in Rhoda, yeah. Uh -huh. So he was on that, and there was another show called Return to Nempton with McLean Stevenson, post-MASH. Neither got picked up, and I remained in Queens where I grew up in Forest Hills, and we didn't move to Hollywood, and my life would have been completely different. So that, that strikes a chord with me, pilot season. But it's interesting. I don't even know if you know it, but minutes after we recorded the pilot, network executives picked it up <laughs> Two episode run, which is amazing. So I'm pretty, pl I'm pretty pleased. American hope, network executives, or yes, is this going to go no, no, international? You know, Flip, Flip, Whitner, the whole gang. You know, they, they picked it up. Um, people might not know that about your dad. Your dad was famous as the the Xerox guy. Yeah, so he he ended up having a lot of success in commercials. He ended up booking fifty commercials over the course of his career. The biggest one was this Xerox commercial where he played Brother Dominic. It's a miracle. He looked up to the sky. It was the first commercial that used a religious figure. So it was very groundbreaking. 1977 aired during the Super Bowl. He ended up winning a Clio Award for it. And they did a number of spots. And eventually he worked for Xerox wearing the monk suit, traveling really? around the country. Yes, this put me through college. <laughs> traveling around the country, visiting Kinko's large corporations in character and ended up doing in upwards of 200 appearances a year for Xerox over a long period of time. He, he appeared in many other commercials, Fleischmann's Margarine, and uh, he did, uh, there was a suntan lotion ad he did, Samsonite, Gillette, Hunt's Tomato Ketchup, you name it. He went up for it. He booked it. He was on a hot streak for about five years where whatever he went up for, he got. So he's the Steph Curry of commercials. <laughs> he was the Steph Curry <laughs> before his time of commercials. Yes. Now, because your dad did that part of the business, did you ever think about going into acting? <sighs> I didn't think about going into acting, but my, my dad was a stand-up comedian, Michael. My mom was a singer, and she opened for him did the Borscht Belt, Concord, Grossinger's, Neville, Falls View. And there was a stretch of time, I was about six, where I would do a little five minute act at the end of their act. Wow. Yeah, I did impressions. I would do Howard Cosell interviewing Muhammad Ali, W.C. Fields. This was very topical humor. And oftentimes did it in front of a thousand people at the Concord and they would put me in a, a little handsome suit, as they called it. Uh, I look back now and, and I wonder why it was a handsome suit. I'm not, I'm not sure that I qualified as, as that handsome. I was cute, but, but handsome, maybe not. And I did shtick for about five minutes. I did it for about four or five months. Then I quit the business. It, it, <laughs> it probably should have been an E! True Hollywood story. Wow, but you know, it, it turns out great. It really does, because look at you. Your background is a beautiful home, beautiful shelves, mm. and I insist on everywhere I go to have a microphone <laughs> banner behind me, which is odd. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big ego thing with me, but I carry it wherever I go. 
Yeah, I, I didn't even know your name before our <laughs> interview. And now, now it's plastered. The okay. Michael K. Show. Uh, yeah. I did see something on the internet, Michael, and uh, the internet has been a fun tool for all of us during these times. You narrating your son Charlie's home run in your home. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and the funny thing is that he, I think I told you this on Monday, he has memorized all my calls, like on YouTube. And like, he wants me to recreate them for him. And if I get one word wrong, he'll go, nope, start again. That's how <laughs> but today we changed it up because that got such positive reaction. And people said, you know, it takes our minds off stuff. Uh, today I passed the uh, baton to Callie and I had her make the call. Welcome back to Yankee Stadium after two and a half innings. No score leading off of the Yankees in the bottom of the third inning is Charlie Kay. And here for the play-by-play -play is Callie Kay. Thanks, Daddy. Here's the pitch. Swing on deep to right. There it goes. See ya. Home run, Charlie K. So we want to join up in the dynasties of the Alberts oh. and the Eagles and the Brennemans and the Bucks. You know, Callie might be next in the booth. I love it. Is Charlie a basketball fan or just a baseball guy? Well, today, for some reason, out of the blue, he picked up a basketball. He said, all right, I want you to do the play-by-play -play of, of LeBron James dunking. Whoa. And I said, I'll, I'll have to talk to you because, you know, it's you or Mike Green that's going to do that. I can't do it. <laughs> well, did you see Green's thing today? On, on I Twitter? did. I did. That was, that was awesome. Uh, Mike, who is a very close friend of yours and a very close friend of mine and uh, just one of the, the best people in not just the industry, but in the world, did a, a little vignette for the NBA and uh, he nailed it as usual with the perfect ender. Bang. Hey everyone. Man, do I miss NBA basketball. And I know you do too. And I can't wait to get back to a packed arena where we watch our extraordinary players do extraordinary things. But we have to play our role. And I know you're tired of hearing this, but wash your hands. I mean, wash your hands. 20 seconds, lots of soap, lather up. And don't be touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. But most importantly, practice social distancing. It's not just some phrase. It's our way of life right now, and we have to practice it. So please do your part, and we'll get back to doing what we love to do. And that's watch NBA basketball. And for me, it's call NBA basketball. NBA together. Bang. But now, you know, uh, I'm a doubtful person. And I've known Mike you know, over, yeah, over 40 years. Yeah. I, I texted him. I said, there's no way that was one take. There's no way. And uh, he, because he's so honest. Because if it was me, I would say, oh, yeah, I nailed it. Yeah. He said it was actually the second take. The first take, I hit the shot, but I stumbled on a word, and I just wanted to make it right. So for those oh. that don't, PSA telling you what you have to do, wash your hands, and then he turns around on a basketball court and hits like, what would you say, 15-footer? Yeah, easy. So it wasn't a layup, and he says, bang, and it was great. But kind of a humble brag that he would mention that he made the shot in the first take but stumbled on a word. Most would say, ah, I missed the shot, I nailed – uh, the the voiced portion, but but Mike needed to make sure you knew that he made the shot. Well, I would disagree with you on one thing. It wasn't a humble brag. It was a brag. <laughs> Nothing humble about it. It was there. It was a brag. It really was. Now, do you if, and your play-by-play play, play, play together in the house that, since you're – No. No, we, we haven't been doing it. And and to be honest, I, I'd like to maybe get a, a shot out there if I could, only if you're comfortable with it. Could I do some play-by-play -play right now, but I involve Charlie? My son is older, so right. to, to reenact something for him would, would feel odd. Charlie, <laughs> I think, would actually appreciate it, if you're cool with it. I'm very cool with it, yeah. So you could loop in the video later. I have no idea, but I'm sure right. Kevin Sullivan can, our genius. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Ten seconds left. Nets down by two. Dinwiddie to inbound. Gets it in for Charlie K. K on the outside. Zigzag move. Oh, beautiful fake by K. He fires. Got it for three. Charlie K puts the Nets up by one. And K is not human. I've heard that before. <laughs> that was great. 
That was great. He's going to love that. And now Kevin Sullivan has a lot of work ahead of him. <laughs> you've, you've got to send some video in. That's, that's really that's, the key. Yeah, because I'm really good at this stuff. You saw how I was setting up to, to do our second show, the first <laughs> one that the pilot's been picked up. Um, what are you doing? I mean, how are you keeping your days busy? Michael, I've uh, really committed myself to, to Russian literature. Really? It's such a passion project. No, that's not true. I, I just thought that would sound impressive. <laughs> I don't know anything about Russian literature. I don't know much about American literature. So we can maybe clip that and they can send that all around the internet. Right. Iron Eagle is heavily into Russian literature. What have I been doing? Not a lot. I will say that I've been married 27 years, Michael, 27 years this summer. And I've had conversations over the last 10 days with my wife that I've never had before. I don't know if this is happening in your household as well. I've asked her questions that I never thought I would ever ask, including how many squares did you use just now? How many? <laughs> this is going to ruin a lot of marriages. Self <laughs> you think? You yeah. Think? <laughs> it's like when baseball players say, you know, I, I want to retire to spend more time with my family. And then their wives go, we don't want you here. No, we I mean, like, we like the setup. We're home. Yes, the <laughs> no. setup has worked for us. And I that's know. why you see guys either return from retirement or end up becoming like near professional golfers. That's for sure. Yeah. Now, yeah. tomorrow, Ian, was supposed to be opening day. Yeah. And uh, I was supposed to be in Baltimore. And uh, I'll tell you what, Baltimore. Opening day to me, always, it sounds corny. You always hear baseball announcers say it. And Kenny Singleton on opening day, I was going to do the game with Kenny and, and, and David Cohn and Meredith. And Kenny always walks up to people on opening day and goes, Happy New Year. Because it has that feel to it. Yeah. Does the opener in basketball have that same feel? Yeah, there, there's that, that high school reunion feel yeah, yeah. to it where everybody's getting back together. Uh, I had one moment at my high school reunion, which was a bit humbling, just as an aside, uh, I think it was my my 20 year reunion, I wanna say. Graduated high school in 1986 and uh, certainly was in the workforce at this point doing football on television, basketball on television and a variety of other roles. And a gentleman came up to me at the high school reunion uh, by the name of Jack Wu. And I knew him in high school and uh, he, he said to me, Ian, great to see you. He said, I got to tell you, in high school, everybody thought you were going to be a big star one day. And I said, oh, Jack, thank you. Thank you so much. He says, what do you do now? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I have a similar story. Tell me. So I went to Bronx Science, and we have a 25-year reunion. And uh, I was... Um, I was the Yankee announcer by then. And uh, so I, I walked in. I wasn't the most popular kid in high school. I had my group of friends, but I wasn't like big man on campus by any stretch, not, not even close. This guy walked up to me and he goes, of all the people in our class, you're the one that I had thought had the least chance to be <laughs> successful. And I shot back. I said, well, of all the people in our senior class, I knew you'd be an ass. So I nailed it. It was almost a brawl. Good times. You want to give a name or we want to leave that anonymous? He knows, he knows who he is. <laughs> so to answer your question, yes. Uh, when the NBA season starts, there is that, that feeling of anticipation. And uh, I think probably like you, that sense of routine that you get into. You juggle the daily radio show with the Yankee games and one doesn't feel complete without the other when you really get into the, the thick of the season. You understand better than anybody else how to handle it, how to uh, deal with your time commitments. And the fact of the matter is uh, you're, not, you're not dealing with that right now. It's a very odd feeling, I'm sure, for you. It's very odd. It's very odd. You know, you almost feel like... Um... 
you know, you don't have a full-time job. I just have one full-time job. I'm used to two. And it's weird. You know, you do the radio show and usually I get off the radio show at 6.30 and then Don and Peter handle the last half hour. And I run upstairs and I take the open and I do the game. Now I, I go outside and I do fake play-by-play -play with Charlie. So it's <laughs> a little different. It is a little bit different. Scary. Um, did your son always want to be a broadcaster? I would say it came to him probably 13 years old. Uh, for me, it was younger. Uh, I was seven or eight when I really had a, a, an understanding of what I wanted to focus in on and what was this after the was. handsome suit? <laughs> yes, this was after the handsome suit, although I did wear it around the house occasionally. You <laughs> may need to talk to a psychiatrist about that. But yeah, I, uh, I knew early on. And the best part for me, Michael, because my parents were in the entertainment field, when I told them at an early age what my goals were, they did not bat an eyelash. Uh, I mentioned to them that I wanted to be a sportscaster at a very young age. And both of them said to me, well, that's what you'll do. Uh, there was no awesome. moment of trepidation. They empowered me to think that, I could achieve it even at seven or eight years old. So in my mind, as I was growing up, I just decided this is what I was going to do for a living, even though I didn't really do anything about it until I got to college. But the, the seed had been planted that this was attainable because my parents were very open to it. I never got the resistance that you've got to do something more conventional. And it, it shows you how powerful that could be especially in your formative years when you don't know any better. You're a ball of clay. And I just felt at a young age that I had a confidence that I would be able to do it. What about for you? When did it, did it hit for you? Me, I, when I was nine years old, I articulated to my mom and dad, I wanted to be the announcer for the Yankees. And, you know, they weren't in the entertainment business, but they didn't say you can't do that. Yep. They said, okay, but make sure you have a fallback because there are so many people that want to do jobs like that. Make sure you study, make sure you read. So there's something else you can do in the business, which is, I still tell kids that ask me advice, you know, make sure you can write, you can do, yep. you know, you can do advertising, you can do PR, stuff like that. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket because you might be unemployed. I mean, there are a lot of people that, you know, would really yep. like to you know, chloroform us and put us into a closet and take our jobs. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> these, these, are, these are gold, these jobs that we have. We're very fortunate. But to have parents that, that don't automatically say, no way, that's crazy. Because I didn't just say I wanted to be an announcer. I narrowed it in. I wanted to be the Yankee announcer. Yeah. The Brewer announcer wouldn't have worked. The Cardinal announcer wouldn't It was the Yankee announcer. So it had to be the right time and the right place. Everything had to fall into order, which it did. But they never said, don't, don't do it, which I think is really important. And was your backup doing IT for computers? There weren't computers when I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we have to do our, our public service announcement every time we end one of these shows. And that's please wash your hands. Please stay home. Please do social distancing. Please don't annoy your wife by asking her how many squares. All of these things are important, Ian. Yeah, and be vigilant. Uh, it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. Uh, what I have found, uh, certainly using Purell and washing my hands more often than I ever have in my life, it's become a conscious part of my day. I never thought I would get to the point with, with my marriage where I would ask my wife whether or not she was going to shower today. That, that never dawned on me that that would be part of our conversation, but it has been. And that's important. Say it out loud. Make sure that that you're on top of this because it's important right now. And for us to get to where we want to be as a society, uh, we've, we've got to be the best versions of ourselves right now. And also to circle back, just because we're in our homes and around our families, do what I did today. Splash on a little cologne. It's not going to hurt anybody. A little here. Put a little there. Here, here, by the chest. Yeah, it works. Yeah. yeah. I, and it's been, it's been a blast as always. I can't wait for the, uh, third episode of this series. Woo! I mean, the ratings are, are rising, Michael. I think we're going to get picked up for, for episode three. Yeah, I'm excited.
Bye, everybody. See ya.